Hello and welcome to Original Sound Chat, where video game music is a work of art. On each episode, it's our goal to help you learn about two soundtracks from the world of games, as well as the people, stories, and critical tracks behind them. My name is Joe DeVader. And I'm Peter Spasia. We're brought to you by Anonymous Dinosaur and Rhymes with Asia. It's time to appreciate great OSTs and the games that they come from without getting too bogged down in music theory. Up first this week for our two games is 1993's Disney's Aladdin, the Sega game inspired by the animated film about a thief with a heart of gold that tries to stop an evil royal vizier's plans involving a magic lamp. Following that is a game based on one of the most famous stop-motion movies ever made, but now transformed into a Devil May Cry-style action game. 2005's The Nightmare Before Christmas, Oogie's Revenge. Happy April Fool's Day, or at least a couple days before you know, we celebrate the day, but this is our April Fool's episode, as we usually tend to do for the show, and we've had different themes in the past years. Oh, God, the fact that we've had multiple April Fool's <laughs> episodes is, is wild, uh, but this year, uh, we kind of thought it'd be really nice to do like a movie soundtrack. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? The tough thing about that is it's... Uh, and get mired in YouTube, copyright, things like that. They're a little more sensitive with film soundtracks than they are with game soundtracks. So why don't we come up with games that are based on movies? And in this case, you came up with your game, which I have never <laughs> heard about. Oh, you haven't. I had barely heard about. Uh, we'll talk about it when we get there, but <laughs> it's weird. But yeah, we got the best of both worlds. Yeah, so we continue the uh, the Disney theme with Disney's Aladdin. And that has its own story, which I didn't know about and was interesting to uh, do some research and learn about. We'll pass that on to you. Joe, how are you doing? What are you playing? I got to play an hour of Elden Ring one time. Oh, congrats. That's, that's more than I have. <laughs> <laughs> I found two bosses and they both demolished me. <laughs> was walking through a swamp and a dragon just sort of flew into the room and and I was dead. Uh, so that's about how that's going. Uh, but because I've been kind of swamped with working on this Kingdom Hearts video, which, by the way, is out by the time people hear this. Ooh, exciting. It will be done and out, finally. So most of my gaming has been before bed, which has still been more... Final Fantasy VIII, I think I'm about smack dab in the middle of disc two, if not near the end of it. Uh, I just got the airship, which usually happens near the end of Final Fantasy games, so I'm assuming I'm getting there. Squall sucks. Oh, sorry. Leon sucks. <laughs> uh, he's a terrible, terrible character. He's like the only time I can say, oh yeah, Kingdom Hearts made this one a better character. It's it's insane to me, but hey, it's fine with cheats. That's what I'll say about Final Fantasy VIII. It's a bad game that's fine when you can cheat. That always helps for sure. Uh, no video games for me. I am just about to move. In fact, by the time this goes out, I will have closed on my fiancés in my house. Woo! That is crazy. So uh, then we're going to be moving the following weekend and so uh probably a good a time as ever to announce that next week will be a solo episode with joe and then the week after that'll be his turn to move so it'll be a solo <laughs> episode with me before we get back to hopefully our regularly scheduled uh episodes with both of us fingers crossed and then both of us by that time will finally be able to i don't know sit down and play a video game <laughs> For more than 20 minutes. Uh, we'll uh, see about that. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Realistically, probably not. But maybe. No composer follow-up news this week. Let's get right into the games. These Disney games that are uh, based on films from that big old world. And let's start with talking about Disney's Aladdin. Aladdin, one of my favorite Disney movies of all time. Same. So you'd think I would know more about the video game uh, involving Aladdin. Well, it turns out there's uh, quite a bit to that story. So Disney's Aladdin 
was released in North America and Europe for Sega Genesis, or Mega Drive, on November 11th, 1993. It released the next day in Japan. There have been ports of this game to PC, Amiga, NES, and Game Boy, all of them in 1994. That's right, an NES game in 1994. Was it a bootleg? That sounds like it should have been a bootleg. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Now, you may be thinking, isn't there a game called Disney's Aladdin for Super Nintendo? Yes, yes, there is. In fact, that released on November 21st, 1993. That's 10 days after the Sega game. But it is an entirely different game published by Capcom and directed by the father of Resident Evil, Shinji Mikami. There would be a Game Boy Color port of the Genesis game in 2000, and a Game Boy Advance port of the Super Nintendo game in 2004. Now, how can you play Disney's Aladdin today? Well, there was the release of Disney Classic Games, Aladdin and the Lion King, that released on October 29th, 2019, for PlayStation 4, Xbox One, PC, and Nintendo Switch. This included the Sega version of Aladdin, the Genesis Mega Drive version. But two years later, Disney Classic Games Collection released on November 23rd, 2021 for the same platforms, all all the big ones. And it added the Jungle Book and the Super Nintendo version of Aladdin. Now, if you happen to own the original 2019 game, you could upgrade to the 2021 game for $10. It was like a DLC add-on expansion pack kind of thing. So we're talking about the Genesis, the Sega version of Aladdin today. And why are we doing that? Well, it released first. And also, I personally remember this one. So, the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive version of Disney's Aladdin was developed by Virgin Games USA and published by Sega. What is it? It's a side-scrolling platform game in which the player controls Aladdin throughout settings and a storyline based on the namesake 1992 animated film. Now, Aladdin's primary forms of offense against enemy characters are a scimitar, a curved sword, for short-range slashing attacks, and apples that can be pelted as long-range ammunition. Now, apples can be plentifully collected throughout the levels. It's almost like Mario coins. There are apples everywhere, except you can throw the apples as long-distance weapons. As far as the difference with the Super Nintendo version of Aladdin, as far as that goes, Shinji Mikami said that if he had not made the SNES game, he would probably buy the Virgin Sega game because it has a sword and better animation. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. What is the plot of the game? Well, it's, it's Aladdin. You've probably seen the movie. Well, the game kind of sets up the plot as such. Quote, in Agrabah, a faraway land of wind and sand, a young street rat named Aladdin must steal to survive. Meanwhile, Jafar, the sultan's advisor, plots to take over the kingdom by stealing a magic lamp from the perilous Cave of Wonders. And then it's like, oh, and our story begins on a dark night, and there are these little cutscenes with pictures and text, and it's, it's, it's adorable for the early 90s. Basically, Jafar discovers that only a diamond in the rough may enter the cave, and this turns out to be Aladdin. But what happens when Aladdin discovers the magic lamp in the cave? Can he win the heart of Princess Ja- Oh, no, no. I'm sorry. What am I talking about? This is an action video game. There's no time for a romantic story subplot. Basically... Can Aladdin put a stop to Jafar's evil ambitions? So, Joe, here's where I'll ask you, what are our experiences with Disney's Aladdin? I'm just glad that there's a game out there that's really ready to trim the fat and get rid of the secondary plot of an entire movie it's based on. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, get rid of that (laughs) beeline. 
Uh, I have never played either, but I've always uh, heard both games. It's one of those classic gaming debates of which one is better. Is it the SNES one or is it the Genesis one? Uh, and I've never played either, so I don't know what side I fall on there. But it's a it's a war that continues to be fought on the front lines today. I have also never played either game, but at the same time, I do remember the Genesis, the Sega version of the game, uh, specifically because you know visiting friends' houses and they happen to have. Sega consoles, and they have this version of the game. Uh, in fact, I didn't know that these games were as different as they were. I mean, they're both platformers. They both have apples. There's stuff with uh, you know the genie and like bonus things and like that. But yeah, the, the big difference is that you know there's no sword attacks in the Super Nintendo version. You have to jump on enemies to defeat them, like you'd expect with a Nintendo platforming. But I, I didn't know it was such a difference to the fact that it was totally different games and different composers because, yeah, you've heard the story throughout the years of like, oh, it's it's a witch is better, as you said. And uh, I just didn't know how different it was. But uh, to me, there is you know more nostalgia towards this Sega version, uh, especially with the soundtrack and used to those instrument sets. And so I decided to look into this one. And it had some interesting connections to uh, composers we've talked about before and also just... An interesting story about how they made this game, though not as much information out there. Uh, once you start getting into the early 90s, unless it's a, a big all-timer kind of game, you're not getting too much documented about how these games were made. But uh, like when we talked about for Sonic 3 and Knuckles, kind of around this time, the early mid 1990s, it becomes involved with marketing deals and how games can be produced from that. So, following the November 25th, 1992 theatrical debut of the film, development for the Aladdin game began in January 1993. Really? It happened after the movie came out? Yeah, and so huh. the release of the game wasn't timed with the release of the movie in theaters, but it was timed with the home video release ah. of the film. And so this is why Virgin was given the deadline of October 1993 to complete the game. And this left them with about three quarters the normal amount of time at the time to build a video game. Now, production involved a team of 10 animators working on the animation frames. And the Wikipedia article threw out this stat saying... It made it the first video game to use hand-drawn animation. I feel like there has to be a point-and-click adventure that beat it to that, like a LucasArts game or something. Yeah, so I'm not too sure if that claim can be backed up, but uh, it certainly was a point that like this game had really interesting animation because then the team would take this animation, and then ship it to Virgin's California facility to be digitized using an in-house Digicel process to compress the data onto a cartridge. So taking the drawings, the animation, making it digital, and kind of making it look cell shaded in that way. Apparently, the budget for the game's launch was $250,000. I mean, that was, I guess... More money then than it seems now. That's inflation, everybody. So Disney's Aladdin on Sega reviewed well. There wasn't really any aggregate score there, but it seems to be kind of in an 8.5 out of 10 range at the time. Uh, the highlights were the animations and the gameplay with the sword combat, especially when it would be compared to the Super Nintendo version. But there are some difficulty spikes in the game. Disney's Aladdin is important to talk about because, as we uh, referenced a few episodes ago, I feel like the game went on to sell 4 million copies worldwide, making it the third best-selling Sega Genesis game of all time after Sonic the Hedgehog and Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Super Nintendo game did not see nearly as much success, and so it feels like uh, the Genesis version kind of holds up over time. 
It won in one way that can be concretely pointed to, I guess. Money. That'd be cash money. So Electronic Gaming Monthly awarded the game Best Genesis Game of 1993 and Best Animation, uh, but it was a time of uh, weird times with video game awards and there not really being anything established, so that was about the best I could find. As far as the legacy of the game, did you know that there was a sequel planned for Disney's Aladdin? Apparently, the studio had pitched a second Aladdin game that would have featured pre-rendered 3D sprites. This was kind of around the same time as the Amiga game Stardust and a year prior to pre-rendered 3D sprites and them being used in Donkey Kong Country. But the project was scrapped by Disney. Which is weird because there there's an Aladdin too. <laughs> like, all right. You're thinking of the movie, right? Yeah, there's an Aladdin too. Like, why why wouldn't Disney just be like, yeah, make a game based on that. Here's the script. There's a two and a three. Of course, yeah, there'd be more movies, but maybe they didn't want to get Jason Alexander's character in Return of the Jafar and <laughs> make it into a <laughs> video game. I don't know. <laughs> the composer that we all highlight for this week, for this game, is Donald Griffin. There's not too much information out there about Donald S. Griffin, but he was born in the United States, and he calls himself, quote, an experienced professional composer, sound effects designer, and audio consultant with an emphasis on computer games, video games, and internet music and sound effects. I listened to a radio interview with a show in the late 90s from it seemed like Texas A&M. It was called Gigabytes, and they had this file saved in .ram format. Oh, boy. Which shows you how big we were reaching. So... Apparently, in the days before computers, Donald Griffin was a composer, and he would, you know, think of music and compose it in his head, and then he'd write out the sheet music, and he would bring this music to colleges to have their band or orchestra play for a recording. Generally, the first run would be a sight read, and, you know, the musicians would kind of see, like, what are the parts that are tricky? But it would be the second recording that would usually be the take that they would go with. I did not think it would be uh, this brief of a recording session, but that seems interesting. But Donald Griffin's big thing is that he is big on the addition of computers into music and the use of MIDI uh, to the point where he became a computer music consultant. And he presented at the 1997 Computer Games Development Conference. <laughs> interesting how GDC probably spawned from that he also has a website at computer-music.com. Yeah, that that's a URL that he got. <laughs> wow. It, quote, contains articles and product reviews related to making music using computers and creating 3D computer animation in sync with music. You go to computer-music.com. It's one of the oldest websites you'll ever see because the product recommendations were last updated in 2001 and the site overall was last updated in 2004. So you want to see an almost 20-year-old website? There you go, computer-music.com. I enjoyed looking through it. It's a blast from the past. It had that .ram interview on there. Just delightful. Add it to the list with the Space Jam website. <laughs> you know, it's almost right up there. <laughs> the discography for Donald S. Griffin. Uh, he composed music for Math Rescue Plus, Mario's Time Machine. He composed the uh, period pieces for that one. Jutland, Disney's Aladdin, Cool Spot, Disney's The Jungle Book, Aegis, Guardian of the Fleet. There's a game from 1996 called Destiny. So it's not the 2014 Bungie game, but it's a PC strategy game. And he also did music for Rampage 2 Universal Tour. He also made the sound effects on the Space Cadet course on Full Tilt Pinball. So yes, that is the Windows 95 baked-in software, the Space Cadet map that everyone knows, if you're of a certain age, at least. You know that pinball game that was... Baked into old windows, he did the sound effects for that map that you know, Space Cadet. Oh, that's a hell of a connection to something. Oh, God. Mm-hmm. 
And then after 1999 with Rampage 2 Universal Tour, there isn't really anything credited to Donald Griffin, though he's given special thanks on music production for Disney Infinity. Okay, that's a throwback. I wonder if they used some old Aladdin tracks in Disney Infinity. That, that may be why. I never played Disney Infinity, so maybe that's why I can't imagine where it would go, but huh. Mm-hmm. But Donald Griffin doesn't have a profile on VGMDB, which means he usually isn't assigned to like a CD or a disc release of a game soundtrack. And so that makes it difficult, especially when we're looking up like the soundtrack for this game. Like there isn't any official titles or really any information about it. But what I could find was that the music was composed by Donald Griffin and Tommy Tallarico. And we talked about Tommy Tallarico on our Earthworm Jim episode. So there was something that I could find. Again, it's it's a little hard to properly source in the age of old information. But on a Disney wiki, uh, quote, five original compositions and five arrangements from the movie were composed by Donald S. Griffin at the request of Virgin's audio director, Tommy Tallarico, who did the Genesis instruments and the incidental transition music. And this would be Tommy Tallarico's last game before he and game director David Perry, so David Perry directing this Sega Genesis game of Aladdin, they'd both go on to make Earthworm Jim. And again, episode 117, if you want to check out how that story continued with the two of them. And that's pretty much all, folks. So let's journey to the Cave of Wonders and start doing a deep dive into the soundtrack of the Sega game, Disney's Aladdin. Let's start with the first track here. This is title slash ending. Clearly, if you have seen the movie Aladdin, you know that this is based off of A Whole New World, the big award-winning song. I'm pretty sure that's an Oscar award-winning song for best original song from a film. I think so. Uh, it's, it's a, it was a big award winner for sure. And the music originally composed by Alan Menken. Of course, then this would be an arrangement. And honestly, compared to some of the other... Uh, versions of A Whole New World I heard on these different Aladdin games and ports. This sounds like the closest to the original as far as key and everything goes. So kudos uh, to Donald Griffin and Tommy Tallarico there. This plays on the title screen of this game. A weird choice to uh, open your title and as you see the Agrabah Palace at night and you know this blue color. And, and this music's playing. It also plays at the end scene. Ah, because Aladdin gets Jasmine at the end, even though you haven't really met Jasmine, I think, throughout the game. So <laughs> who cares? He gets the girl. Happy, good ending. Uh, but, you know, a pretty faithful translation of A Whole New World. And, you know, kudos there. Yeah, but something about the instrumentation. This sounds like it's out of a DOS game, not a Genesis game. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is about it, but it just sounds, I don't know, it it does match in key and all that, like you said, but it's just, <sighs> these are some real cheap sounding Genesis midis. I don't know. I, considering they were given like six months to make this game, that's not super surprising, but you know. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. It, it's not your usual Genesis midi fare, but uh, I think it does the job pretty well. Another good arrangement of a song from the film continues in the second critical track here, and this is Agrabah Market. Thank you. 
This plays in the first level of the game. There are 10 levels, so level one is called Agrabah Market, and I think that's why it's being titled here as such. But then why is it based off of Prince Ali? A song that appears like halfway through the film. Of course, the original Prince Ali, originally composed as well by Alan Menken. Again, I think it's a really good, faithful arrangement of the song. So kudos. You get a little bit more of you know these kind of Genesis midis, these instruments that were more uh, familiar with being on that Sega platform. But yeah, I, I, this is the level that I think a lot of people point to. You point to this first level where Aladdin's going around the Agrabah markets and learning how to use the sword and learning how to use uh, these apples. I mean, it's three buttons on that Genesis controller. It's apple, sword, jump. Pretty easy there. But yeah, I, I just found it funny that like uh, Prince Ali, one of my favorite songs, uh, probably number two on that list if I had to guess from uh, favorite songs from the film Aladdin. But it's here in level one. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why it's not one jump ahead. That's in level three. What? <laughs> Okay, sure. You know what? Fine. Uh, Prince Ali is also one of my favorites, but it is not my favorite. Uh, I am assuming we both probably have the same uh, entry for favorite, but mm-hmm. we'll find out, I suppose. I'm guessing you're right. And uh, yeah, this one has a little bit of the the crunch that I expect from Genesis soundtracks, but still not enough. It's very a lot more low key than I'm used to when it comes to the genesis but this definitely sounds a hell of a lot more genesis than a whole new world did i'll give them that it's interesting to hear like some of these like fluty instruments come in there if i can describe them as such but like kind of the higher synths in there it's it's a neat little mix up and i think they do a pretty good job trying to what did the movie do how can we translate into (laughs) these genesis instruments as far as original music goes Let's get to number three on their critical five for Disney's Aladdin, and this is The Escape. So Griffin and Talarico seemed pretty proud of this one. Uh, early in the game, you learn about like the bonus levels where you get to like control Abu, the monkey character, and like be avoiding these falling barrels from the sky. And if you get hit once, you're done. But you collect all these little rewards for doing so. And this level is uh, level six of ten. It's when you're in the Cave of Wonders and things have gone awry, and Aladdin first has to. Uh, you know, run and platform and dodge these kind of boulders and all that. So it's not the level you're thinking of. I picked this piece, though, for a couple reasons. Uh, One, it's a more intense version of that bonus stage music that you've already heard probably at a couple points if you've been playing the game. But also this is then reused in the final stage, Jafar's Palace. And so, yeah, it's a track they're proud of. They use it in quite a, a bit of places throughout the game. And uh, yeah, it is catchy. It does not feel like it should belong in Aladdin, I don't think. But I feel like this is more like when we think of Genesis music. Like, all right, we're getting a little closer here. Oh, very much so. This song is great. And upon hearing it immediately, my thoughts go to The Messenger. Mm, Sure. Like, I could easily hear this being in The Messenger or, or a game of similar makeup. But yeah, no, this is this is really really good, uh, especially when you're you're comparing it to like this song had to stand up against Alan Menken music, so it better be good, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, and I I dig this song a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think this is yeah the pride of the original compositions here, so I had to be in the critical five. We continue these tracks, though, with number four for Disney's Aladdin, and this is Inside the Lamp. Thank you. 
Friend Like Me is the best song in Aladdin. It sure is. Put it down there, that's right. Absolutely. Uh, no competitors, no no dissenting opinions here. It's it's the best. Robin Williams was the best. And so, of course, this piece is based off of Friend Like Me, originally composed by Alan Menken. And this takes place in the game. So here's some perspective. Inside the Lamp is the name of the level, and it's representative of the big old celebration that takes place during Friend Like Me. A pretty important part in the movie when Aladdin meets Genie for the first time. Uh, Joe, what would you say that percentage-wise is through that movie? Like 33 40% through the movie? I'd say about 40% sounds right. Yeah, so... All right, we're kind of at that point, right? Uh, no, this level is level 8 out of 10. <laughs> so all the drama with Jasmine and, oh, are we are we going to deceive her? And do we do the magic carpet ride? You know, you think of the magic carpet ride in the night sky. That's the Super Nintendo version. That is not the Genesis game. <laughs> because we zoom to the Sultan's Palace for level 9. And then it's Jafar's Palace for level 10. Rocket to the moon. Okay, but yes, a friend like me, you get these jazzy vibes here. And again, a really nice job translating that original classic song into keys and instruments and everything, considering the limitations of the Genesis chipset. Uh, just a jam. And you know what? If we were talking about the actual movie soundtrack here for April Fool's Day, uh, this would be here with a bullet. But you know what? We'll take a 16 bit implementation of it. Yeah, it still feels a little empty, though. Like, I don't know, something, it needs more backing, I feel like, overall. But for the most part, I mean, it's Friend Like Me. It's hard to mess up Friend Like Me. <laughs> like, I mean, I guess it's not that hard. The Aladdin live action happened, so uh, <laughs> you can 100%. I guess you can, yeah. Screw it up. But, you know, this is this is pretty good, all things considered. I agree, It's it's overall a good... Adaptation to the Genesis's uh, ability in rendering sounds. Let's wrap up the Critical Five, though, with a boss theme. And, you know, I, I guess they call it Boss Theme. <laughs> Yeah, I really remember the boss fight where you have to, like, hit Iago with your key uh, blade and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's what happens, right? Well, you do a fight Iago in this game, actually. But it's more like he's, like, running on that treadmill thing. <laughs> it's, just, it's a weird boss fight. And, of course, Jafar, he's the Cobra. It's, it's everything you'd expect, right? Uh, but, yes, this is the boss theme in original composition for Disney's Aladdin on Sega. And, you know, I think compared to some of the other tracks, especially ones that we'll get to on the cutting room floor, it's a little shallow and it's based on like kind of simpler rhythmic ideas, but it's important, especially when it's the final boss and all that. So I think it's important to include it and round it out here. And it's not a bad boss theme. I just think it's kind of a basic one. Neat instruments, uh, but just there could be more here, I think. Yeah, I think overall it has the same problem that I had with the adaptation songs, like straight from the movie, is that it feels there's not enough of it. I think Shallow is a very, very good way of describing it. Like, this should be where there's more of that crunchy, like, lower bass note that the Genesis is so good at, and I don't understand why there's not more of it here. It, it just, it's it feels underwhelming. More than anything, honestly. It makes you acutely aware of the layers of sound that are at play here. And, you know, I think, especially at this time, like the best tracks, the best compositions kind of blend that in and do some tricks to make you think it's bigger and wider than it is. Uh, listening to it again closer, where's the percussion? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's actually probably a big part of it. Yeah. 
I I just now realized that too. There's no percussion in this song at all. And I feel like that goes a long, long way to helping you uh, flesh out the sound. And I know they could totally do it at the time. We've heard it plenty in uh, the Genesis is really good at drum middies. Yes, yes, absolutely. So I feel like that's it's missing here, and it kind of loses a bit of the gravitas from a, a musical perspective. A couple tracks here on the cutting room floor, though, and I, I liked these, but I feel like. Those five kind of set the stage and told the story, but here this is the desert. This is level two in the game, The Desert, and this is probably the first instance of like a full level original composition because you'll hear some music that kind of tells like the story. It's like, you know, some some heavy chords or you get like the incidental transition tracks. But like this is, I think, the first big original music piece that you hear in the game from Donald Griffin. And I think it's really cool. It's nice to hear the swing jazz. Uh, You know, they do hi-hat here. Talking about continuing percussion, it's not much, but you get the riding hi-hat. And then there are some good bass MIDI implementations kind of a bit into the piece there. So uh, the Genesis can reach those lower frequencies for sure. I think it's a neat piece. I, I really like the musicality here, but uh, it's just it's tough to compare to some of those classic Aladdin compositions from Alan Menken. Honestly, I think this sounds more in line with what I expect from the Genesis, just like Escape. I think Escape is a better song overall. I think you were right to put that one in the in the Critical Five. But I mean, this is a really good song. I don't know if I would have pegged it being from an Aladdin game, but overall, yeah, I, I really like this piece. That swing jazz is some good stuff. Weird and not fitting here, but hey, you know what? <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> The other one on the cutting room floor for me is Rug Ride. Between the first level with Aladdin exploring Agrabah and its markets and jumping on things and defeating the Sultan Guards. And this level, this is the other level you think of if you think of Disney's Aladdin. And it's, he's in the Cave of Wonders, everything is red, it's falling apart, and he's riding carpet. So it's a different way of moving throughout the game. And you get these genie finger points of like, go high, go low, go either. And it's almost, I don't know if it's like as difficult as Battletoads, but it kind of is a little reminiscent of uh, you got to remember the order or at least have split second reactions because it is difficult. So this is the music that plays here. Uh, I like the digga, 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 like kind of like the energetic pace of it, which makes sense. You're you're zooming on carpet there, but I just feel like it fell a little short to uh, the melody of the escape and how it was used throughout the game in the bonus stages, just amplified for the escape. But this is a classic level and one that you definitely think of if you're familiar with the Sega version of Disney's Aladdin. So I just had like a fight or flight response because at some point in this song, there is a pizzicato MIDI and it sounds almost identical to a pizzicato MIDI used on the soundtrack of Donkey Kong 64. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to process that. It just gives you those video game horror flashbacks. (laughs) It's a good song, yeah, I, I I guess. Also, what do you mean you're riding carpet? It clearly says rug ride. <laughs> Are you calling carpet a rug? <laughs> How dare you, sir? How dare you? Uh, yeah, it's this is a pretty alright song. I can't I cannot process past the pizzicato though. It sounds so similar. What will I never forget about Disney's Aladdin? I mean, I'll never forget the movie, but Maybe I should play the game sometime. And it sounds like the modern re-releases on the Disney Classic Games Collection, uh, they have things like, you know, save states, rewind, even codes for, like, 
invincibility or unlimited apples or things like that. So it sounds like a pretty good way to play it if you don't want to get past you know, the whole classic games frustration. Might be one worth checking out. Or even if you really want to compare to the Super Nintendo version that even Shinji Mikami uh, doesn't prefer. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe... I I like to believe somewhere in his contract, it said like, not allowed to play the Sega version. <laughs> if you touch it, you're fired. Uh, I hope we got to play it one day. If you're out there, Shinji Bakami, and I know you are because you released a game today at time of recording, but if you're out there, I hope you got to play the Genesis version of Aladdin. Before we talk about our next game, let's talk about a transition piece. Let's talk about a fan cover, a fan remix, whether it's from YouTube, OC Remix, wherever. I looked up Disney's Aladdin Sega cover and found this piece called Arab Rock from Gear X2 on YouTube. And it's his take on the track we've called The Escape. But it's an acoustic guitar version. He does a really good job with it. In fact, Tommy Tallarico even showed up in his comments to say, quote, Holy crap, this is amazing. How am I only hearing about this now? You played it better than I ever did. Thanks for the memories. Such an honor to have worked on that game. The next one we did after this was Earthworm Jim. And so for Tommy Tallarico to show up and have such praise for it, I think it's a pretty good one. Hope you enjoy it. We'll be right back. All right, all right. Let's move on to... A game that you probably have never heard of after talking about a game you probably have. Nightmare Before Christmas Oogie's Revenge was released for PlayStation 2 on October 21st, 2004 in Japan. Then, a year later, it would release on both PlayStation 2 and Xbox on September 30th, 2005 in Europe and October 10th, 2005 in North America. It was developed by Capcom, so there's another thing connecting it. You briefly mentioned the SNES version of Aladdin, developed by Capcom. It was also published by Capcom in Japan and Europe, but in North America it was published by Buena Vista Games, which makes it the second game I can think of published by Buena Vista Games, the other being the original Kingdom Hearts. Yeah, that's right. It is a character action game with combat very similar to that of Devil May Cry, though it is simplified and sort of toned down a little bit because they kind of had the feeling that this game was going to skew a little younger in audience. Don't know why they thought that, but hey, sure. The player is put in control of Jack Skellington, and they must make their way through 24 chapters, so it is literally just Devil May Cry, earning a grade from S to D at the end of each chapter based on length of combos performed, damage taken, all that stuff. And it is a sequel to the movie. I think maybe a canon sequel to the movie. That's insane. <laughs> I, I don't think anything contradicts it at the very least. Uh... But yeah, if you didn't catch on earlier when I said the title, this is a character action game that takes place in the world of the most famous stop-motion animated film of all time, The Nightmare Before Christmas. Uh, it's up there, I guess, Wallace and Gromit is probably the closest any stop-motion film's ever come. Maybe it's James the Giant Peach stop-motion? I think it is, yeah. But I mean, this is... An all-timer. I mean, mm -hmm. people of a certain aesthetic love this movie. Hot Topic has made so much money off of <laughs> The Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah, they sure have. Uh, I also did not know this, by the way. This game came out the same day as a GBA game called The Nightmare Before Christmas, The Pumpkin King, which serves as a canon prequel 
to the original movie. <laughs> Get out of here. I have never heard of that game ever in my entire life. I don't even know what it looks like. I didn't look it up. I don't want to know what it looks like. So, the plot of Oogie's Revenge. A year after the events of The Nightmare Before Christmas, Jack has once again found himself bored with the repetitive nature of Halloween. In order to help him find new ideas and new scares to use, Dr. Finkelstein provides Jack with the Soul Robber, a green, whip-like, ectoplasmic weapon. With the Soul Robber in tow, Jack leaves Halloween Town to find a way to improve Halloween once again. But soon after he leaves, the Troublemakers Lock, Shock, and Barrel take advantage of his absence to resurrect Oogie Boogie, who proceeds to take over the town, and lock Jack's friends away. On December 23rd, Sally manages to send word to Jack about what's happened, and he returns on Christmas Eve with a new goal of once again defeating Oogie Boogie and freeing the town from his evil clutches. So here's where I will ask the question I already know the answer to, uh, what are our experiences with uh, The Nightmare Before Christmas, Oogie's Revenge? I am watching a trailer for this, and this <laughs> game is blowing my mind. I had no idea any such thing existed. A mashup of DMC with The Nightmare Before Christmas. Jack Skellington is Dante? <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, now this is wild, much less the fact that it could be considered a canon sequel. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Jack has three forms in this game. He can be in his regular form, where he uses the soul robber. He can be in his Santa costume, where he can drop booby-trapped presents. And he can be in Pumpkin King form, where he is basically turned into a flamethrower. Sick. It's wild. Uh... I remember seeing this game sometimes in Blockbuster, and I never picked it up. Uh, I never played it or anything. And honestly, I had forgotten about this game until about a year ago, maybe two years ago, when uh, the YouTuber Film Cow, who does a nightly stream where he, he goes and he plays a game on stream for an hour every weeknight. Uh, one of the games he did during Halloween was this one. And it was the first time I had ever seen gameplay or heard any of the music, at which point I found out that, you know who has played Oogie's Revenge? Your Matt. roommate. Oh, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, that is a good guess. I'll give you that. My roommate being that would totally fit. But no, Matt apparently played this game as a kid. So that's interesting, but I'm sad because I didn't find anything about the development of this game at all, whatsoever. I at least wanted to see if I could find, like, hey, why does this game exist? I know Capcom was really buddy-buddy with Disney for a long time. I didn't think that they were buddy-buddy with Disney in 2004. <laughs> when you think about Capcom's Disney stuff, that's like, the SNES, and that's it. But, eh, I guess. But sadly, yeah. No information about where this game came from, why it exists. I do know that it was released to very middling reviews. <laughs> uh, it has a 65 on Metacritic for both PS2 and Xbox. Woof. Most of the praise is given to the game's, like, really strong aesthetic. It does a very, very good job at looking like the Nightmare Before Christmas. But apparently, the simplified combat just made it not feel as tight as things like Devil May Cry. Uh, and it just, it didn't work as well. It didn't come together as well. It also got a ton of criticism for its camera, which doesn't surprise me at all, because... Most 3D games had awful cameras in that era. You kids don't know how good you have it. Though, Wikipedia made sure to mention that British newspaper The Times gave it a 5 out of 5, <laughs> calling it the perfect children's game. So that's interesting. One thing that I'm surprised I didn't see in any other views was... uh. 
the voice lines in this game are really, really annoying. All of them. Uh, every time you save, you talk to that character who, like, he takes off his hat and there's a smaller version of him and the smaller version takes off his hat. The Russian doll dude, who's like a stack of Russian dolls or whatever. He's the one you save with, and every time you save, he gives like this 15 second voice line that can't be skipped every mm -hmm. single time. Uh, and also, every time Jack does his sort of Nero style yank move, he yells, Soul Robber! Soul Robber! Soul Robber! It's so <laughs> annoying. Uh, and the other problem, which we'll get to when we. <laughs> get to the music is that uh pretty much all of the boss music has vocals and we'll get to it i'm i'm shocked i had never heard this game's soundtrack because it is kind of cool even if kind of uh pales in comparison to the original movie but those vocals loop for the whole boss so <laughs> they just keep going instead of what i imagined would have been the better choice where you know Maybe just make it an instrumental version after the first loop. Not, you know. So that's the only other thing I know about this game, and I'm shocked I did not see more reviews mention it. But, as expected, uh, the game won no awards whatsoever. And largely has been forgotten if it was ever known at all. I kind of hope one day that Capcom and Disney get together and put out, like, Either a remake or just, like, I don't know, port it to the Switch or something. I don't know. Because even if it sounds like it is a mediocre game to play, it's unique that it exists. And I think it's cool that it exists overall. I think it would be an interesting game to play. You know what else I didn't find any information about? The composer we'll be highlighting today being Kengo Hagiwara. No information whatsoever about this man. In fact, the only other game outside of this one that he is credited with doing the music for is Game & Watch Gallery 4. <laughs> but mostly, he is a sound designer or a sound engineer on most games, and he's still working in the industry now. He has worked on Ultimate Ghosts and Goblins, Harvest Moon DS, Island of Happiness, Front Mission and Front Mission 2, the PSP remakes of Final Fantasy and Final Fantasy II, Resident Evil Revelations 2, he was a sound designer on World of Final Fantasy, and most recently in the past couple years, Paper Mario, The Origami King, and Scarlet Nexus. Oh, neat. So, yeah, he's still working in the industry, still doing uh, stuff all over the place. In terms of historical development research for the score, I couldn't find anything on the game. You think I found something on the music? Though, it should be noted, a lot of it is actually based on Danny Elfman's original pieces for the original movie. Of course, I believe... Who is it that does the voice for Jack in the movie? The singing voice? Because I know it's not the same guy doing the speaking voice. Is it Danny Elfman? I don't think it's Danny Elfman. <laughs> oh, it actually is. Good trivia bit. Nice oh, job. So I remembered... Another thing, though, is that uh, Danny Elfman does not provide the singing voice for Jack in this game. Instead, mm. it is the regular voice actor for Jack who does the singing voice. And he's not bad, but he's certainly not as good <laughs> in the role. And part of that might also just come down to this is a game made by a Japanese studio that decided to adapt a bunch of English music. Hmm. Who knows? It could be that. But this soundtrack is absolutely wild and kind of crazy ambitious for a licensed game. So let's get into the five critical tracks, the first of which is Oogie Boogie's song. Well, 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 Jack the Pumpkin King finally made it, huh? Oh, I've been waiting. So how do you like my Oogie Town? <laughs> It's over! It's over! This time you've gone too far! It's over! I'm serious! Just who do you think you are? Just 
because you fool the town doesn't make you king. You better give up surrender now. Huh? Now these are of course the track titles that the internet has given these songs because as you might expect, this game has never gotten an official soundtrack release ever. In fact, it was kind of hard to find the soundtrack on YouTube. Surprisingly so. But uh, this song is obviously based on the song, Oogie's song, which is the best song in The Nightmare Before Christmas, if I may be so bold. Uh, I should get out in front of this. There is a version of This Is Halloween in this game, but it's literally just This Is Halloween. It's just the song. Mm. It's like unchanged. Okay, okay. Because, like, that's my favorite. I agree, like, Oogie Boogie song is the best, but I'm partial to This Is Halloween. But, yeah, if, if it's nothing unique or different, then, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's got some different vocals, but it's all the same lyrics, and it sounds basically the same. There's nothing worth talking about there. Also, shouts out to What's This? I just forgot and remembered yeah, what's actually, this. Yeah, actually, what's this is what's this is also very very good. Uh, I like that. I like Sally's song. Man, that soundtrack's just really good. In uh, general. Yes. But uh, this, of course, as I said, based on Oogie Boogie's song from the movie, but it's a duet now. This plays during a boss fight with a shadow Oogie Boogie near the very beginning of the game, and Jack and Oogie are having like this song battle during the real fight. It's really cool. Um, this is kind of something that all the songs do in the game. But hearing this sort of... You can kind of hear <laughs> the difference in Jack's singing voice and this one, like, right off the bat. Mm -hmm. His cadence does not fit very well in Oogie's song. But overall, I think just for what it is, this is a really, really cool piece. I think you're right. The The word just from this alone is ambitious, that you're trying to take, you know, one of the better songs from the original soundtrack and do a new spin on it. Also, uh, the promotional art that when you find this on YouTube, the promotional art with the three jacks there is blowing my mind. That's insane. <laughs> it's, it's such good art. This game aesthetically and like... All that seems like it's super cool, and it kind of sucks to hear that it's not fun to play. But the second song on the Critical Five is another one based entirely on an original song, though one you might not expect to have been remixed into a boss theme. This is Crypt Creeper Battle. This plays during a boss fight with a giant spider, and it's Sally's song. That's not a song I would have expected to ever be turned into a boss theme. And this is the one I heard when I was watching that stream, where it loops every time it ends. You hear the vocals, they start over every time. Hmm. It gets very, very annoying, kind of, but you can still hear, uh, I think that's still Catherine O'Hara. It was hard to find concrete information on that, but I believe Sally is still Catherine O'Hara in this game. Uh, but you're fighting a giant spider to this while Jack and Sally sing about how, oops, maybe we should have seen this coming. I am going to make a subsect of the internet mad <laughs> i hear the beginning of this and i imagine it playing to a dark souls boss <laughs> now granted when jack starts singing uh, that goes completely out the window but i think having Catherine o'hara sally's voice here like it, it kind of gives me vibes of like an Amy Evans kind of track. Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> like, it kind of gets me that. So, especially when you say you're fighting a giant spider, I'm like, oh, yeah, Soulsborne. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good point. 
And I don't know. I don't think this song fits super well for a boss fight. But again, ambitious. Very, very ambitious. And I respect it. But to me, the one that is the weirdest interpretation is, and I'm, again, shocked I had never heard this because this is, like, again, one of my favorite songs in the movie. This is Hail to Mr. Oogie. We knew he'd fight to set things right, so we got bad guy to attack! Stop! I've had enough of you! Your punishment is overdue! You've instigated chaos here and turned this town onto its ear! Hail to Mr. Oogie, put Jack to the test! This plays during a boss fight with Lock, Shock, and Barrel, so obviously it has to be a rearrangement of Kidnap the Sandy Claws, another one of the best songs in that movie. It's really weird. Like, I don't know what else to say. Uh, it cuts out a lot of the intro section. And I don't think Hail to Mr. Oogie fits as well in the lyrics as Kidnap the Sandy Claws. But I, again, I have to respect the attempt. It's not terrible. And also you get to hear Jack tell Shot, Lock, Shock, and Barrel to shut up, which is pretty good. This is the weirdest one, I feel like, and I don't know why. Why is this weirder than Sally's song? What is happening? Yeah, how did I, like, expect and also not expect this song <laughs> to show up? Also, I didn't know that Paul Rubens voices Locke. No, that sounds about right. That's that's <laughs> weird. Um, hmm, interesting. I, yeah, to have this kind of be interpreted in this way is, uh, wow, not what I would have expected. I don't know which one it is, but at one point, one of them starts singing like a full thing in a different manner than the original song was sung. And it, it doesn't sound, I don't know which character's singing. It doesn't sound like any of the three. I have no idea, but it's one of the kids and I can't tell which one it is. And I don't know. This song is like, I had to put it on here because it's so bizarre and it's also just the continuation of like the theme of jack sings back but differently yeah. <laughs> it's it's just what a weird game how does this game exist how does this soundtrack exist i'm glad you're talking about it on the show because we're learning something today you know though there is actually original music in this game much like there is in the aladdin games uh, the one I kept seeing brought up in YouTube comments over and over and over again was Hinterlands. So like I said, YouTube comments kept mentioning this specific track and talk about a change in tone. Woo! Parts of it sound Resident Evil-ish. Why do I get Dark Souls vibes again? Yeah, actually, yeah. No, Soulsborne is another one where like, yeah, I could see this in there. It's a really, really neat piece, especially considering its competition is rearrangements of music from the movie. Uh, I'm glad they at least got to have their, their regular composition chops sort of show in at least one of the tracks, multiple of the tracks, but this is the only one that I think fit in on the Critical Five. Because again, every YouTube comment I saw was like, oh man, the Hinterlands music is so good, it's the best song in the game. And I think I might agree, actually, overall. Yeah, oh, holy cow. Uh, Kengo Hagiwara shouts out. You did a great job with this one. It is very different than everything else we've been hearing so far. But you know what? I can You can imagine this in a video game. And mm -hmm. it's a great addition. Uh, <laughs> would it be the best addition in a 
Jack Skellington meets Dante from Devil May Cry. I don't know. <laughs> but it sounds like, yeah, you're exploring this like desolate wasteland. And I, I could totally picture that there. Yeah. Being in the, like, for, for anybody who doesn't know, the Hinterlands is an area from the movie. It's the, the forest where all the holiday doors are. Mm-hmm. Yep. There's no, like, leaves on the trees and anything like that. But it's, it looks like it's, Super stylized in the game, from what I can tell, like black and white and stuff. So, yeah. Then let's get to uh, the song that I was told I have to, upon punishment of death, include. It is critical track number five, Filthy Finale. What's this, a trick? I'm not impressed. You're bad and now you're tall. It makes it all the more worthwhile to see a giant fall. Talk, 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 but I tell you. This giant's going nowhere. If I were you, I'd take a hike. There's danger in the air. First of all, what a good name. Second of all, this is another song, once again a rearrangement of Oogie Boogie's song. This is the final boss theme, and actually this one is really good. I'm not gonna lie. I think this version might be the best of all of the reimaginings of any of them. It's not like, again, the original Oogie Boogie theme is much better, but overall, I think this is, is kind of cool, the idea that it is the final boss, and it's essentially a rap battle between (laughs) Jack Skellington and Oogie Boogie, in a way. It's it's neat, and another one of those where it's like, oh man, this is where the ambition is really showing up. Oh, for sure. Love the orchestration here, and just the instrumentation overall. And it just has the feeling of stakes. You Mm -hmm. compare it to, like, the final boss of Aladdin and its music, it's like, I know technology limitations at the time, but wow, this delivers. And yeah, are you using the Oogie theme again? Sure. Uh, but I think you're getting its proper due. This is actually the third time in the game the song oh my God. reuses <laughs> Oogie Boogie's theme. Uh, it's every time you fight Oogie Boogie, and that's three times. Two of them are fake Oogie Boogies, and they also both use Oogie Boogie's song. Because, I mean, to be fair, what else are you going to use? The man has his own song for a reason. But yeah, this song is really, really cool. And the only drawback I can think of is that it loops everything. So I hope you're ready to hear this song on loop multiple times. Mm. Now, for songs on the cutting room floor, I actually have another of the original compositions in here because it just sort of stood out to me a lot. The first track on the cutting room floor is Pumpkin Patch. I'm listening to this song, and for some reason, the thing that came to mind was this sounds like if you took a Resident Evil soundtrack and then shoved it into Grim Fandango. Wow. Yes. I feel so strongly about this song being a combination of the two, which, to be honest, is kind of a really good pair of things to put together in terms of aesthetic if you're trying to do the Nightmare Before Christmas. Uh, Apparently, some YouTube comments said that this game has, like, a darker tone than the movie, which, uh, sure. If you're trying to have that DMC edge, I guess. Yeah, I I guess. But, yeah, hearing this song, that's all I can think of, is this sounds very similar to something I would have heard in Grim Fandango, but through the lens of a survival horror game. Uh, My mind continues to be blown. I'm amazed that the music, the original music at least, continues to be this good. (laughs) And uh, yeah, wow, you were sending me texts throughout the week of like, I I can't believe this. This is crazy. I'm like, all right, I'll I'll wait. (laughs) But wow, no, you're right. It's, It's a surprise that I did not expect when it came to the original stuff. But hey. But speaking of original stuff, let's talk about... They actually did write 
an original vocal song in this game. Uh oh. And it's Finkelstein's song. This town has changed, my boy, since you've been away. Without a pumpkin king, it's Oogie Boogie's way. Doctor, please, oh, can't you see you're wrong? You were the king, but now you're nothing but prey. Oogie Boogie is back and he's planning to stay. It's a crazy web you're weaving, Oogie Boogie. Of all the characters to get a song. <laughs> Uh, this plays during a boss fight with Dr. Finkelstein because, uh, I believe in the plot, his brain has been switched out by Oogie Boogie, so he works for Oogie Boogie now. And it's, uh, it's sure a song. <laughs> another duet between Jack and Dr. Finkelstein. It, it's fine. It's fine. I'm just imagining if they could, like, <laughs> make a stage musical or, like, just turn it into a movie. Like, you can, yeah, maybe get Danny Elfman to record the, the Jack vocals. But there's some impressive, like, writing chops here as far as just, like, I think the amount of content, you know? Well, also just considering the fact that this game was developed by a Japanese team. Sure, yeah. And now we have all this music in English that overall works fine uh, you know yeah you're right we've had some uh, questionable translations in the past and <laughs> i guess it works yeah it, it works better than you'd think it does and you know i i again very much respect that they did go as far as to make a new song for the game kudos on that what will i never forget about oogie's revenge i mean i barely know anything about it i know more now obviously but uh I would love to see this game get a re-release. Everything I see about this game and everything I hear about this game, all I can do is, like, sit and think, like, how the hell does this game exist? How is this a real video game that exists in this world? Uh, it's, it's just a neat little bit of trivia that most people probably haven't played, and from the sound of it, probably weren't missing much, but it, really interesting to talk about at the very least. Oh, for sure. And I'm just really glad you brought it to the show. I'm glad it inspired uh, this theme for April Fool's of Disney movies. Uh, we'd like to talk about movie soundtracks, but you know, we got plenty of uh, arrangements of classic Disney songs, and yeah, that works uh, for us. You know, April Fool's Day on the internet has uh, gotten pretty weak yeah. over the years, but you know, we at least like to contribute some good fun to it. And remember the good old days with this show. So with Disney's Aladdin on Sega Genesis or Mega Drive and with the Nightmare Before Christmas Oogie's Revenge, that will do it for us this week on Original Sound Chat. You can find me on Twitter at Pete Speakeasy. Joe is over at String Pixel. The video version of the show is on the Rhymes with Asia YouTube channel, but it's that MP3 podcast version that you want. And that's hosted by Anonymous Dinosaur at anondino.squarespace.com. That's where Joe's other podcast, Smasterpieces, is hosted. And you can find Smasterpieces and Original Sound Chat wherever you get your podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, even on Spotify, where we have a feed of podcast episodes. But we also have a big Spotify playlist where if we cover a song from a video game on this show and it's on Spotify, it's getting added to that monster playlist. Joe, is anything being added this week? No. Uh, as we said in both segments, neither of these games has ever gotten an official soundtrack release, so not on Spotify or anything, unfortunately. It does make it difficult. Well, when you're done listening, you can find the show on social media at Soundchat OST. You can leave some feedback for us. How are we doing with these episodes? Also, suggestions for games to cover in the future. We'd like to continue doing that in 2022. All right, reminder, I am off next week. It's a Joe solo episode. So, Joe, who are you talking about next week? Well, we got a relatively big release, not like a giant release, but we have a release to sort of coincide with next week. So I will be talking about Ryo Yamazaki. All right, Joe, let's play us out. I can't believe I found a remix. <laughs> yes! I genuinely, genuinely can't believe I found one. 
but it was posted on the YouTube account Siva Gunner, that oh. one that everyone knows, but it is a remix of a filthy finale by the artist DM Dokoro. It's really good, and I genuinely can't believe I found one. So enjoy that, I guess. That's amazing. Thank you so much for listening this week on Original Sound Chat. We'll see you next time. Take care. Talk, 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 but I tell you, this giant's going nowhere. If I were you, I'd take a hike. There's danger in the air. Whoa, whoa.